Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, August 13th, 2014, not that long ago, the World Health Organization reported that the death toll from Ebola in four West African nations, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria, had passed 1,000. The Ebola outbreak would capture the world's attention, as many of you remember, including here in the United States. Two and a half years later, the outbreak ended with more than 28,000 cases and more than 11,000 deaths. But let's talk about the early-ish stages of the 2014 outbreak with, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hey, Jody. And our special guest for this episode, someone who has been very helpful in guiding us through this current pandemic, uh, former acting administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and host of the excellent podcast In the Bubble, Andy Slavitt. Andy, thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Hey, Jody. Hey, Nicole. So, Andy, I guess I'll start actually with sort of a big question first, which is how much does looking back at former outbreaks like this provide lessons for today? And how much do we have to realize that every pandemic is different in its own way? Well, this is different and this is harder, but there are a lot of a lot of lessons. I think a lot of things that were done well and and things that are sometimes not done well that you need to, to focus on. I think the principal two things about that outbreak that we can learn uh, and how it was handled is one, when you're handling a uh, public health crisis, you have to make it the single most important thing. You can't make it co-equal with you know, kids getting back to school and the economy and all of these other things at the same time, because if you don't make the public health issue first, you never quite solve it. And so getting to a better economy now, and we're not quite getting to um, safe schools because we're trying to balance too many things. And in a crisis, you have to decide what the most important thing is and just do the best you can with the rest. The other thing uh, I think that we learn is you need to have a really airtight, accountable structure for making decisions, for understanding the situation as they arrive, for communicating with people on the ground. And so all those things are the same. This is a less deadly and more contagious virus, so there are some differences, which add some complexities and make some changes. Nikki, I mean, you you researched the Obama administration. Did they do that first thing that Andy pointed out and sort of make it the main thing for, for a while there? Sure. I mean, they didn't have to make it the main thing in the U.S., although they were quite focused on it here in the U.S. I think that the the thing that they did that was so important was they focused on international cooperation. They went to the source of the outbreak and they started just levying all of the resources that they had in order to help those countries contain the outbreak. And that made a lot of sense, especially because of what Andy just said, which is that it's a less communicable, much more deadly disease. And so if you you can, if you can contain it, and it's much easier to contain, then you're saving lives in the U.S. by keeping it from spreading much further from where it was. And you need to, right? Because it is incredibly deadly once people contract it. So in the summer and fall of 2014, there were a lot of the types of measures that we all are now used to hearing about. There was a regional travel restriction, though never an international travel ban, and that was a a little bit of a conversation. Um, There was contact tracing on the ground, often done in coordination with the WHO. Medical workers who returned from the area were on strict quarantine, no surprise. Um, And a lot of this was really coordinated across countries through the WHO. So, Andy, you know, can you just give us a sense of what that kind of coordination looks like on a day-to-day 
basis as an outbreak like this is starting to bubble up in another part of the world? Yes. I mean, I think that Nikki's exactly right. If you take the, the stance that this is just another part of the world and it's far from us, oh, this thing is in China, which is sort of how I think it initially felt with SARS-CoV-2, you miss the fact that, that these things travel fast. And so, you know, we used to have offices around the world from the CDC that were located in all of the places where these situations were likely to break out. So we had better, you know, we had better eyes and ears and we had the ability to act more quickly. And then, you know, people were just more fluid with the country. So we were working with them more hand in hand as opposed to dropping people in. You know, the office in Beijing, unfortunately, as we all now know, was, was reduced dramatically earlier in the, in the Trump administration. And of course, our relationship with China is different than our relationship was back then uh, with the countries in Africa. Yeah, I mean, things like the defunding of the World Health Organization, I mean, those kinds of institutions can serve as eyes and ears. They give us the reporting data. They make sure that the U.S. and other countries have an understanding of what is happening in other places. And sometimes that understanding is hindered by the host countries. We've talked about this before with the so-called Hong Kong flu, that China in the middle of the Cultural Revolution was not able to provide that kind of data and was not part of these international organizations. But each of these outbreaks that we've talked about have really underscored the necessity of international cooperation because these kinds of epidemics don't respect borders. I I want to talk a little bit about how these play out and diseases like this play out in the sort of public imagination and the public response. And then that obviously ties into the media reaction. Ebola is, is interesting because, I mean, I think in a way... It tapped into a lot of fears of immigration and particularly, you know, stereotypes about Africa. But it was also weirdly, I think, sort of a known quantity. I mean, people knew what Ebola was because it had showed up in in movies and books and it was was a bit of a known quantity and there had been previous outbreaks. I guess, you know, part of my question is with COVID, Andy, do you think there was anything about this disease being something that was new that led people to not kind of really get their heads around it, both within and without of government? No question. It made it much more complex. You you know, with a novel virus, you want to understand the properties of it and, and educate yourself and everyone needs to know about it as quickly as possible. The CDC didn't really do that here. I mean, people are focused on the testing issues. But for example... The awareness that this was spreading asymptomatically was one of the key insights. It's one one of the things that makes this much more complex to manage than than almost anything else. And we were months into this, and there were still parts of the country, still hospitals, still governors that weren't aware of that. And you're racing against the clock because if something grows exponentially, it's I, I describe it as if... You're at, the, you're at a dock and you see a speedboat and it's 15 feet away and you swim after it. By the time you get to 15 feet, it's 100 feet away. And when you're chasing something that's growing exponentially, it is so important to get those learnings done quickly. And I think the time we spent ignoring it or denying it or whatever you want to call it, calling it a hoax, was such valuable time. So let's talk a little bit about how this played out in the United States. Um, There were four confirmed cases in the U.S. The first in late September was the Liberian citizen Thomas Eric Duncan, who was visiting his family in Dallas. Duncan ended up dying of Ebola in October. Two of the nurses who cared for him also tested positive. Those were the only cases of the disease being transmitted in the United States. Uh, Those nurses recovered. And then there was the case of a doctor who had gone to volunteer in West Africa and had returned to New York City, and he eventually recovered as well. Um, And I kind of want to talk a little bit about the media environment, Nikki, around this, because when you compare the current pandemic to Ebola, as we've been saying, there are some lessons and we can highlight some of the ways that things have changed for the worse in terms of coordination and communication. But I will say that the sort of bullshit media circus element of all this, uh, that was definitely there in 2014, especially around those few cases. There were rumors, there were people who didn't really know what they were talking about spouting off, including uh, Donald Trump. Uh, You know, maybe this sowed the seeds for how badly this kind of thing plays out when it comes to hysteria and the spread of misinformation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember this Ebola outbreak. And the reason I remember it is because there were these news reports that were just like, and then this 
person who we now know has Ebola got onto the New York subway and if he touched like one handle and somebody else touched it, then Ebola is going to like spread across New York and it's going to be out of control. And there was this, I certainly felt a surge of adrenaline when I heard yeah. that, but there's well, this there was like, a, I'm remembering fear. this now. There was a rumor that he had gone bowling at this like hipster yes. bowling alley that I would go to in Williamsburg and then everyone was like, oh my God, there's Ebola at Gutter. And you know, it's just all these sort of ridiculous things that were E-bowling. spinning out. Ebola. That's right. That's the New York Post. Well, at least it got us a good New York Post headline. Sorry, I, mean, I derailed your very smart that. thought. Uh, go, keep going. Well, no, and then, of course, like people who benefit from that kind of fear-mongering really leaned into it. It was a way of scoring political points against the Obama administration. And even though the administration actually did... <laughs> you know, pretty great job of containing Ebola in the United States. The very fact of its presence in the U.S. became this hammer for Republicans and Donald Trump, who was, you know, putting on his political boots at the time to really begin to bash the administration. And do you do, do, you, have, do you have any recollections of that? Of that um, I mean, you were in, in the administration at that time, right? Yeah, I do, was. You, do you remember the circus? At I that was. Point? No, I, I was. And, and I remembered... You know, and, and inside the administration, it didn't feel like a circus. It felt like an overreaction, but it felt like an understandable overreaction. So people were fearful. People played into those fears. It became kind of the only story. And, you know, you sort of understand when facts move in a way that no matter what you say, you have to demonstrate you've got your arms around them because coming on TV, you know, like it just wasn't going to be enough, at least from our perspective, to go on TV and, and you know, sort of be, be, belittle the thing. We've got a different effect today, I think, because back then, you know, Dr. Fauci was a recognized, fully supported expert. And he, by the way, he's no less an expert four years later uh, or six years later. But, you know, our respect for people with expertise in this topic allowed us to get their hands around things. You know, today, in part because it's a novel virus, Every scientist and expert is going to, to some degree, at some point, be incorrect about something. And as soon as an expert's incorrect, it gives everybody else permission to think they're on equal footing with that expert and that their opinion is just as validated. And so, and social, I don't remember how, if social media was what it was like in 2014, but you know, now, I mean, you know, there are like 500,000 epidemiologists on Twitter who you've never heard the word epidemiology before. But now they're, you know, they're expert and they're expert at pointing out all the ways that scientists are wrong. And so th- this, th- there's, a, there's a meta thing in the media that goes on today that is d- degrees separated from like the woman in a hospital on a, on a ventilator and someone holding her hand. This is like 17 connections yeah. away from that. Yeah, I think that this is a pretty good case study in the difference between the war on expertise and something the Obama administration was really committed to, which was science-backed, evidence-based policymaking. If you go through, as I have, like all of the documents that the administration was putting out, both during the campaign in 2008, but then for the next eight years, evidence-based, evidence-based, evidence-based. That phrase was in just about every single document. And it was something that people had a real commitment to. And now we're seeing what epidemic response looks like when that is not a core value. So on that front, I mean, it feels like the Ebola outbreak, at least in my mind, was a bit of a a wake up call. And certainly the idea of a global pandemic, you started to hear about it more and it maybe found its way to the top of the list of real threats that were out there. Obama himself talked about the next pandemic as kind of one of his big fears when he was leaving office. Um, You know, tell me if I'm reading that right and if you can characterize what happened within the administration in the wake of Ebola. We certainly know what happened heading into the transition in 2016, where a lot of the work around those issues were not embraced by the new administration. But, you know, was it a wake up call in that way? Well, to go back even a little bit further in 2005, 2006, Larry Brilliant and a number of other people got George W. Bush to really understand the threat and the inevitability of a global pandemic. And and if you think about it, like if someone came to you and said, I want you to spend some energy thinking about an incredibly low probability, high severity event, you know, you'd ask yourself, well, how much attention am I supposed to, to pay to this relative to the concerns of everyday Americans? But I think that presidents throughout history have said, 
we need to have energy and focus on these very and these downside scenarios. That's why people talk about nuclear war. That, that, this is a, sort of one of these obligations. And so when that hit, it, it crystallized in Ron Klain and the president and Dennis McDonough, the need to leave behind something that would allow us to react quickly. Because a lot of the scenarios, including a novel coronavirus, which is one of the things that was in the handbook that was put together for the Trump administration, you would need to react to very, very quickly. And if I if you feel, I mean, to digress for a second, presidential transitions are really, really interesting things, and I yeah. believe I understand them now in ways that are deeper than than ever. But President Obama said to us in 2016, after the election, that George W. Bush had run the best transition in the history of transitions, and he was so incredibly grateful that he told us all that we had an obligation to do at least as well on behalf of the country for the Trump administration. And we put together incredibly helpful materials because there's so many things that are in folklore. When the president of Chile says X, he really means Y. (laughs) All of these things that are learned through generations never say the, the word inconceivable. It's just a whole bunch of things. But the point is that you do your best here and at least in at least in my experience at HHS, the the new incoming administration didn't want to be briefed by us, and and the political team ended up not being briefed by us. I believe in the case of the pen, of global pandemic stuff, the White House did sit through a briefing on it, but they regarded us as the problem. I mean, I think if it had anything connected to Obama in it, I think they were there to dismiss it, which was I think very different than the way Obama heard what the Bush administration had to offer. So I think the work was there, and I think it was ignored for reasons that I think we probably are beginning to understand as we understand the nature of the presidency. Yeah, I mean, that transition between Bush and Obama, I'm sure we'll come back to this someday on the show, but it really was. I mean, it was in the middle of this massive financial crisis, obviously a a handing off of power between two parties. And Obama was pretty hard on Bush during the 2008 campaign. He disagreed, obviously, with a lot of things that happened under the Bush administration. But the way that those two teams worked together to make sure that in the midst of this massive crisis, everyone could hit the ground running was really impressive. Now that brings us to the end of the show. So thank you to Andy Slavitt, whose podcast is in the bubble, and it is fantastic. You know, one of the things I'll just say that I really like about the show is you just kind of go slice by slice. You know, you don't just try and give all the takes at any given time. You're just trying to kind of create this body of understanding over the course of the show, and I really do appreciate that. So you should check that out. It's in the bubble. But Andy, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you, Jody. And uh, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. We have transcripts of the show available on our website, thisdaypod.com. Special shout out to Kala Nakua for helping put those together each time. Get in touch. Show ideas, comments, questions. Email us at thisdaypod at gmail.com. Coming up on Sunday, our weekend election special, we will talk about politicians who just can't help but run for office over and over with our first ever repeat special guest. Uh, Maybe you can guess who. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. This is something that we take very seriously, but the key is identifying, quarantining, isolating uh, uh, those who contract it and making sure that practices are in place. Uh, that avoid transmission. And it can be done, but it's got to be done in an organized, systematic way. And uh, that means that we're going to have to help these countries uh, accomplish that. Radiotopia.